What I'd like to do is just uh, do a quick introduction of our uh, five panelists by name and organization, and I'll give a little more details. I introduce each one of them for our talk. Uh, so from uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, we have Jason Piotter, who will speak first. Uh, we have Jorge, Jorge uh, Varnais from the Department of Energy. We have Victoria Huckabee from the NRC. NRC um, Huckabee, I'm sorry. Huckabee from the NRC. We have John Donaldson from Centris. And we have Jean-Luc Luchum from our ASN, um, our French regulator, and he's one of our commissioners. So I appreciate that. So let me start the presentation, as I said, with uh, Jason Piotter. Jason currently serves as a senior program manager for accident tolerant fuel and advanced reactor fuel activities in the Division of Fuel Management in the Office of Nuclear Materials Safety and Safeguards at the NRC. He is also a senior mechanical engineer and technical reviewer for the containment, structural, and thermal branch within our, his office. He started with the NRC in 2004, so he's uh, just celebrated his 20 years at the NRC. He received a bachelor degree in civil engineering from the University of Iowa and a uh, master's degree in structural engineering from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. So let me turn to you, Jason. And I apologize, I did have the titles of the slides up here. I'm sorry, go back to yours, Jason. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm the lead off hitter for this session. Hopefully everybody had a wonderful lunch and you're all refreshed and ready to go for the afternoon. <coughs> As you all no doubt well know, we are in a rapidly evolving environment that can have potentially significant and far-reaching impacts on the number and scope of new fuels licensing actions that are submitted to the NRC. We have seen significant interest in advancing nuclear power, including what appears to be unprecedented bipartisan support for ATF and advanced reactors, as demonstrated at regional congressional hearings related to new fuels. And I think any objective observer this demonstrates that both legacy and accident tolerant LWR technologies as well as advanced reactor technologies are all increasingly seen as a tool to reduce the nation's carbon footprint. In addition, geopolitical issues and economic drivers may result in short-term or long-term supply disruptions, which has subsequently increased focus on enhancing and expanding the domestic fuel cycle for new fuels. A working understanding of these external drivers is essential to effectively plan regulatory workload, skill sets, and resources at the NRC and within the industry. The NRC has been actively preparing for advanced reactor fuel reviews by leveraging past licensing experience, performing preliminary technical evaluations, and evaluating the regulatory framework and its applicability to non-LWR fuel designs. We have made significant strides in our readiness to review applications for licenses and certifications for fabrication and transportation of near-term advanced reactor fuels. But a key point here has to be that we're not doing this preparatory work blindly or haphazardly. Our preparatory activities build upon this previous experience we have licensing enrichment and fuel fabrication facilities at higher enrichments and certifying transportation packages also with higher enrichments and novel fuel designs. We are actively gathering technical information for longer term advanced reactor fuel concepts to support front end fuel cycle licensing reviews. In addition, we are actively seeking technical information, including fuel performance data, which will inform ongoing evaluations of the regulatory framework and guidance for both the front end and the back end of the fuel cycle. We've determined that the regulations are performance-based, technology-inclusive, and are expected to be sufficiently comprehensive for risk-informed licensing of advanced reactor fuel, processing and fabrication op operations, transportation, and storage. While the NRC has not identified the need to make any changes to the regulations for near-term fuel concepts such as trice or metal fuels, or longer-term advanced reactor fuel concepts such as molten salts, we must continue to assess our regulatory framework to identify any challenge and or data needs to ensure continued readiness to support licensing and certification. This must be done with a mindset of agility, 
active awareness and flexibility. So how do we test that? How do we test that what we're doing, leveraging our past experience and our preparatory activities will actually serve us well in the future? And even in the now, we look at what we are actually accomplishing in the licensing and certification space, and it is a lot. Those areas of focus at the moment are fuel fabrication and precursor activities, such as enrichment as well as transportation of feed material and fresh fuel for the front end of the fuel cycle. Consistent with our current practice, these applications for new fuel, new fuel facility licensing, design certification of fresh fuel transportation packages, design certification of spent fuel storage gas, and design certification of spent fuel transportation packages must all demonstrate compliance with NRC regulations such that new fuels can be safely managed in all areas of the fuel cycle. As I've already alluded to, the NRC has recently issued 13 major licensing actions and two authorizations, including licensing of the high assay, low enriched uranium demonstration at Centris American Centrifuge Plant, which you'll hear about later. We also issued an amendment allowing global nuclear fuels to produce accident tolerant fuel with increased enrichment up to eight weight percent. We've also approved several nuclear criticality methodology amendments to support accident tolerant and advanced reactor fuels. We have met the need by dates for all of these cases, all while performing thorough, transparent safety, security, and environmental reviews. Currently, we are reviewing three major licensing actions, including the triso -X new fuel facility. And over the next three years, we anticipate between 10 to 12 additional major licensing actions, including increasing enrichments up to 20 weight percent for enrichment facilities, fabrication facilities, and amendments for down blending of high enriched uranium. In addition to these higher certainty future actions, we have many informal discussions with potential enrichers, fuel fabricators, and reprocessors that would indicate sustained licensing activities for the near future. While the number of actions we have completed and anticipate are similar, the future actions are expected to be more complex, including completely new fuel facilities. As a result, we are paying extra attention to those future licensing actions to ensure that we have the appropriate critical technical skills and appropriate and necessary regulatory research and guidance identified and in place when needed. For storage and transportation, so to date the NRC has issued 15 COCs and letter authorizations for transportation of accident tolerant fuel, HALO including UF6 and TRISO fuel. Further examples for TRISO fuel, uh, fuel include ver the VersaPack and the Optimus L packages and I think finally, this is an important one, the DN30 transportation package, which allows for the transport of UF6 enriched up to 20 weight percent. Um, that was completed in March of last year, and I think it was a, a watershed moment for our activities in the new fuels arena. In the near term, we anticipate additional transportation packages for the back end of the fuel cycle, as well as storage applications related to ATF and advanced reactor fuels. Early work has begun both domestically and internationally to evaluate any new technical challenges that may result from those waste streams and that may present new phenomena that we have not encountered before with traditional LWR fuels. Looking forward, the NRC will focus on resolving technical issues as they become apparent and seeking ways to enhance efficiency and effectiveness. With respect to the front end of the fuel cycle, there are potential challenges for HALU feed material and advanced reactor fuels, such as limited critical experiments and benchmarks for higher enrichments. The additional availability of those critical experiments for the entire HALU range, as well as criticality benchmarks, would support the efficiency and effectiveness goals that I mentioned earlier. Similarly, there may be also operational challenges, such as chemical hazards or the security requirements for the possession use and transportation of Category 2 materials. The staff will continue to gather available information and develop guidance as needed. Finally, we are encouraged to see external stakeholders, including the international community, 
starting to focus on the back end of the fuel cycle, even at this very early stage of new fuels deployment. The NRC will continuously evaluate our regulatory framework and assess information needs to support our readiness for the back end of the fuel cycle, including potential areas of technical focus, such as source term evaluations, criticality and shielding evaluations, thermal performance, material degradation, considering both short-term and long-term performance. To assist with these regulatory needs, the staff at NMSS has begun to develop the new fuels atlas, which will provide a holistic picture linking regulatory, technical, communication, and budgetary activities into one complete planning and action tool. The atlas is intended to chart both the front end and back end of the fuel cycle for all near-term and longer-term fuel concepts by licensee or certificate of compliance holder. So what does the new fuels atlas look like? Well, it comprises multiple things at this point. One is an infographic, another is a web page, and then we have what is called our regulatory planner. And essentially it's a representation of everything that the NRC is working on uh, within the new fuels atlas umbrella. When this is complete, it will help us identify the needed actions and activities to ensure the NRC's continued readiness to regulate new fuels. The regulatory planner will consolidate information on current and future activities. It will cover the pro programmatic areas such as licensing, oversight, and research activities associated with enrichment, fabrication, and transportation of the different anticipated new fuel technologies. Obviously, I think everyone is aware, but in case you're not, this includes things like triso, metallic fuels, and molten salt fuels. You'll hear more about this regulatory planner um, over the next several months as we get ready to deploy it. The Atlas is also intended to enhance our stakeholder communications through the use of an infographic, part of which is pic pictured in these slides, and the new HALU public website. We hope to enhance public confidence in our abilities to effectively regulate these new fuel technologies by showing how our existing regulatory frame framework is able to accommodate them. With respect to the communication tools, our intention is to enhance our stakeholder communications by providing a one-stop shop for everyone to find licensing and state of the industry information in a more user-friendly way. One last area that I wanted to touch on before I close is how we will go about maintaining and enhancing situational awareness and cooperation. I think to start with for our day-to-day -day activities, this includes things like letters of intent, pre-application engagements, routine interactions with licensees and applicants. This helps us understand their plans, their business needs, the external factors that could, they see could infect the impact and timing and scope of their submittals. I want to touch on the pre-application piece of this um, just for a second because I think this is one of those areas which is probably the most underrated and most valuable tools that we have in the licensing realm. And one of the points that I really want to make about this is that when we're looking at these types of activities, with, with, especially with new and novel technologies that we haven't seen before, the place to sort of figure out what the path is going to be in terms of regulatory strategy is not inside the review cycle. Those things need to happen prior to the review cycle because the review cycle compresses a lot of what we do. And so I can't stress this enough that any, any applicant coming in that has something that, that's new or novel or something we haven't seen before or that we haven't licensed before, we must have these pre-application engagements. Um, it's, it's absolutely critical to the success of, of not only the NRC but of the nation as a whole um, to, to be able to deploy these new fuels. A couple other points, many of the licensing actions that will be needed at these facilities are interconnected, uh, which means that we're going to have to make sure we understand what the flow of information is and how these licensing actions are going to come to us such that we're able to plan for our resources accordingly. Uh, as I mentioned at the opening of the presentation, this rapidly changing environment is and I think will be the norm moving forward. So situational awareness and cooperation in areas slightly more removed from the norm or from the day-to-day -day operations 
are going to be just as important as those day-to-day -day activities. This includes understanding what's happening with the uranium fuel supply itself and understanding where, that, where the industry is with that and where that feed material is going to be obtained from. I think the other issue that we need to also make sure we pay attention to is what our other government partners are doing, understanding the role and responsibility that they have and understanding the actions that they're taking for this new fuels environment. And lastly, international engagement. I would say that when we look at the international community, it is another backstop for us to be able to measure and assess whether or not we're meeting the needs with respect to new fuels and new fuels deployment. Final point I'd like to mention here is that when viewed holistically, our current state for licensing certification, our planning and preparation for the future, and our proactive approach to understanding all facets of the uranium fuel cycle have positioned us well to modulate our workload, our workforce, and our innovation risks, and to make the best regulatory decision we can to protect public health and safety. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate it. And uh, your, one of your last couple points is a good lead into our next speaker, uh, working and understanding where our uh, partners are, uh, both in the NR or U.S. government as well as internationally. And with that, I'm going to turn to one of our partners at the Department of Energy, Jorge uh, Narvaez, who is a general engineer at the U.S. Department of Energy in the Office of Integrated Waste Management in the Office of Nuclear Energy. He leads a DOE group tasked with the technical analysis and considerations for incorporating small modular reactor and advanced reactor spent fuel into the waste management system. Prior to joining the Office of Nuclear Energy, Jorge worked as a project manager in the private sector designing <clears throat> digital control systems for U.S. and South Korean nuclear power plants. He has also served as a research associate for the White House Office of Science and, Te Science and Technology Policy and as a technical technology and national security fellow at the Assistant Secretary of the Army. Jorge received his Bachelor of Science degree in Physics and Mathematics from Adelphi University and his Master's in Nuclear Engineering and Engineering Physics from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Welcome, Jorge, and thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jorge Narvaez, and uh, in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to be talking about some of the activities that the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Spent Fuel and Waste Disposition is uh, doing to uh, prepare to manage spent nuclear fuel from advanced reactors. This is just a disclaimer that more or less says that anything that I say to you today will not preempt anything that is in the standard contract. There is a lot of interest uh, around the world and also here in the U.S. to deploy uh, advanced reactors. Um, the last time that I checked, uh, there's around 20 advanced reactor designs uh, from companies based in the U.S., and uh, that's uh, increasing uh, every, every single uh, month. There, you, you see in the news there's a new advanced reactor company uh, proposing a new design. Uh, I want to highlight three companies here. Uh, two of them are being funded by the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, uh, which is uh, trying to bring uh, the X Energy X E100 reactor and also TerraPower's uh, Nation Reactor for um, near um, demonstration, and also Kairos, uh, which is working on the Hermes uh, reactor um, facility in uh, Tennessee. So there's a lot of advanced reactor interest. Uh, many of these designs typically vary in the type of fuel that is being proposed to be used in the power levels, uh, and the um, this is a challenge uh, for the program uh, that the Department of Energy is conducting. Because the spent nuclear fuel is going to differ from the current inventory of light water reactor uh, spent nuclear fuel. Under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, uh, the Department of Energy is responsible to take title and control of the spent nuclear fuel from the commercial utilities. Uh, for any advanced reactor company planning on um, engage with the NRC to uh, obtain a license, uh, typically two steps m must be completed. Uh, for a uh, construction permit, it would typically, uh, the NRC requires under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, uh, it requires uh, a, a proof that the company has obtained a letter of good faith negotiating uh, with the Department of Energy. And for a 
an operating license, the NRC requires under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act that any uh, applicant shows proof that the applicant has entered into a standard contract uh, with the Department of Energy for the Department of Energy to take title and control of the spent nuclear fuel uh, for disposition services. Uh, in this slide, I'm showing on the left uh, two examples. Uh, these are publicly available documents that you can find on the uh, NRC Adams website. On the left side, uh, you can see all the way to the left, there is a letter issued by the Department of Energy Office of General Counsel to Kairos Power saying that Kairos is engaging in uh, good faith negotiating with the Department of Energy. Uh, and this letter was used by the NRC as a check mark, check mark to say that they uh, fulfilled that requirement uh, in order to get a construction permit. Uh, to the right side, you see a letter from the NRC to Abilene Christian University asking Abilene Christian University to provide proof that Abilene Christian University is engaging with the, uh, with the Department of Energy to obtain a good faith negotiating letter. So in the Department of Energy, there are different activities uh, trying to um, prepare to manage a spent nuclear fuel from advanced reactors. One of those activities is called the Backend Management of Advanced Reactor, or BMAR. I will be referring to, uh, to the working group as BMAR. Uh, it's an integrated project management, uh, integrated project team, which is more or less a fancy word for a working group that we use in DOE. Uh, and it's uh, being directed by the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Spent Fuel and Waste Exposition, Paul Murray. Uh, but I do have to mention that some of the, uh, the work that we, we are doing in BMAR is also uh, being directed by the DOE Office of General Counsel. Uh, for, the, uh, for the BMAR effort, we are using a systems engineering approach to, to divide the work into uh, a system of systems, if you will. And uh, one of the main objectives, the central work of the BMR team is to collect and consolidate data from advanced reactor vendors. To do the following two things. Uh, first is to make a technical assessment on the feasibility of storage, transportation, and disposal for uh, advanced reactors. And the second one is to uh, develop a rough order of magnitude cost estimate and compare that to uh, the same activities, but for live water reactors. The reason why we're doing this is because eventually, under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act, DOE is going to uh, take title of the spent nuclear fuel, so DOE needs to understand what it needs to dispose of eventually. However, at the same time, the advanced reactor companies need to understand the requirements that they need to satisfy under, under the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. Uh, in the BMR team, we assemble a, a team that uh, is composed of different offices. Um, so we have the Office of Nuclear Energy, which is the, of, the, the office directing this work. We also have federal staff from the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. We have experts from five different national laboratories. We also have uh, collaboration with the uh, DOE Office of General Counsel. These are some of the advanced reactor vendors that we're working with. Uh, and I mentioned before, at the very center of our work is a data collection effort. Uh, we are working with any advanced reactor vendor that is willing to work with us. Um, the data that we collect is not only going to help us understand uh, what the, the field looks like before it goes inside the reactor, but uh, also how it looks like after it comes out of the reactor. Uh, to date, we have collected hundreds of uh, vendor proprietary and expert control data. Uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to be talking about um, the different types of data that we collect. So we are very interested in being able to characterize the data so that, you know, uh, requires um, DOE to understand uh, how the, the fuel looks like. So we're lo looking at data. We're asking the vendors questions about uh, the volume, the mass, the density of the, of the fuel. Um, for the chemical composition, we're looking at the initial enrichment and any remaining enrichment after it comes out of the reactor, um, burn up, uh, other types of um, data that help us um, manage for uh, storage, transportation, and disposal includes uh, looking at the composition of the fissile and fertile material, uh, any long-lived fission products, and also 
uh, uh, interesting data points that also help us plan accordingly is to look at the operations and um, the 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 rate at which uh, spent nuclear fuel is being um, discharged from a reactor. So that includes looking at um, the core, how many fuel elements are in the core, how uh, often uh, spent nuclear fuel needs to be removed, uh, what is a fell fuel element, uh, among other things. So once we collect all of this data, we start working on uh, internal reports. And uh, these uh, internal reports include uh, the expected amount of, of spent nuclear fuel and high-level waste uh, that um, a reactor design or um, a company is plan uh, planning on uh, generating for the lifetime of the, uh, of the uh, reactor. Uh, some considerations for transportation, for storage and disposal. Uh, a rough order of magnitude cost comparison with light water reactors. Uh, we, uh, I need to specify that this is not a uh, review by DOE. We're only looking to collect data so that we can inform ourselves and also the DOE Office of General Counsel. Um, so for the last uh, couple of minutes that I have, I want, I want to talk about the near-term work uh, that BMR is doing. Um, so under the leadership of Deputy Assistant Secretary for Spent Fuel and Waste Disposition, Paul Murray, uh, we, uh, BMR has been tasked to um, analyze the generic types of spent nuclear fuel from advanced reactors. So think about um, trice of uh, spent nuclear fuel, metallic fuel, and molten salt reactor uh, spent nuclear fuel. And the goal of this is to answer the four following questions. Um, the first one is, uh, can the, spend, the generic spent nuclear fuel be disposed of um, in a um, generic repository that is similar to previous uh, DOE concepts? Uh, if not, then what, what, what is it going to take to dispose of the material of the spent nuclear fuel? So that, that would involve what kind of treatment do we need to do on the spent nuclear fuel to make it disposable? How long is it going to take? and how much is it going to cost to dispose of a spent nuclear fuel, including any uh, treatment cost, if that's applicable to a particular uh, generic type of spent nuclear fuel. Uh, we are hoping to make the, the results of this work available <coughs> to the public. Um, that's gonna be forthcoming. Uh, we, we started doing this work uh, at the beginning of this year, and uh, hopefully we can have some of that uh, available to the public um, maybe next year. Um, so, we, while we, we are planning on making this publicly available, uh, we are required to protect vendor proprietary data against public release. And I believe that's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge. Appreciate it. And it's uh, great to hear uh, what our fellow federal agencies are doing. It really helps uh, us being independent from DOE to really get an understanding of uh, where we see some of the drivers out there and what we can see coming forward and having that coordination early really helps as Jason said it helps with understanding where where we can budget and uh, engage in pre application activities. Next I'd like to uh, introduce Victoria Huckabay. Uh, Victoria currently serves as a senior project manager in the NRC's Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation in the Division of New and Renewed Licenses. She joined the NRC 10 years ago as a reactor operations engineer. Prior to working at the NRC, Victoria worked in the private sector as an engineer and a quality assurance manager. She graduated from Georgia Institute of Technology with a master's degree in aerospace engineering. So thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Uh, uh, so, good afternoon. My name is Victoria Huckabay, um, and uh, today I'm going to discuss the NRC's perspective of the past, present, and future of spent fuel reprocessing. I will briefly talk about the role of reprocessing in the manufacturing of new fuels, provide an overview of the history of reprocessing facilities in the United States, discuss the ongoing pre-application engagements with the NRC by potential future applicants for reprocessing facility licenses, and close with an overview of the current regulatory framework for reprocessing facilities and a path forward for future development and enhancement. Spent fuel reprocessing, which is sometimes referred to as used fuel recycling, is defined as the chemical separation of fissionable uranium and plutonium from irradiated nuclear fuel. Several processes exist for reprocessing of spent fuel with a chemical-based 
plutonium-uranium reduction extraction, or PUREX process, dominating. This process works by chopping up fuel elements, dissolving them in concentrated nitric acid, and chemically separating uranium and plutonium using tributyl, tributyl phosphate. There is a modified version of PUREX called UREX, which does not involve the isolation of the plutonium stream. Spent fuel reprocessing reduces the volume of material to be disposed of as high-level waste and reduces the consumption of raw materials. In addition, the level of radioactivity in the waste from reprocessing is much smaller and after about 100 years falls much more rapidly than in the spent fuel itself. The recovered unused plutonium and unused uranium can be used to manufacture new fuel, gaining some 25 to 30 percent more energy from the original, original uranium in the process. In 1964, the Atomic Energy Commission granted an operating permit for commercial reprocessing to the nu nuclear fuel service for the West Valley plant. Uh, the West Valley plant operated from 1966 to 1972. A total, a total of uh, 640 metric tons of spent reactor fuel was processed, which resulted in a large amount of radioactive waste, which was left on site for many years. However, most of it went through a vitrification process in the early 2000s. In 1967, the Atomic Energy Commission authorized General Electric to construct a spent fuel reprocessing facility in Morris, Illinois. The facility was built in 1971, conducted functional testing, but did not operate as a reprocessing facility on a large commercial scale. Um, in 1972, it received the license to store spent fuel, and for many years, Morris served as a wet independent spent fuel storage installation. In 1970, Allied General Nuclear Services began construction on a larger commercial reprocessing plant in Barnwell, South Carolina. However, in 1974, the Atomic Energy Commission stated that any decision to permit nuclear fuel reprocessing on a large scale would require the development of an environmental impact statement under the National Environmental Policy Act. In 1976, the facility was halted mid-construction due to the risks of proliferation. Although the ban on commercial reprocessing was lifted by President Reagan in 1981, it did not regain support in the United States due to economics and historical changes in national policy. There were no advances in the area of reprocessing in the United States until 2006 when the Department of Energy announced the Advanced Fuel Cycle Initiative to create a scale demonstration of UREX plus separation process and develop an advanced fuel cycle facility. The intent for the Advanced Fuel Cycle Initiative to develop proliferation, uh, was to develop proliferation-resistant nuclear technologies with the help of the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership, or GNEP. The goals of GNEP included reducing the U.S. independence on foreign sources of fossil fuel and encouraging an economic growth, as well as recycling nuclear fuel using new proliferation-resistant technologies to recover more energy and reduce waste. However, in the following years, Congress significantly reduced GNEP's funding while DOE continued moving forward with reprocessing research and development. Starting in 2006, the NRC staff began interacting with the Commission regarding the topics related to the development of conceptual framework for licensing GNEP facilities, as well as licensing of any commercial reprocessing facilities in the United States. The NRC staff submitted several SECI papers to the Commission, some of which are highlighted in the slide. SECI 090082, um, in that paper, the staff provided an update summary of the regulatory gap analysis and informed the Commission of its plan to develop the technical basis for a proposed rule that would resolve the high priority gap. In SECI 110163, not shown on the slide, the staff provided a draft regulatory basis for licensing and regulating reprocessing facilities that addressed the previously identified regulatory gaps and discussed a path forward for updating the regulatory framework. Then in SECI 130093, the staff recommended moving forward with developing a reprocessing specific rule, Part 7X, which would provide an integrated and cohesive regulatory framework that would address the specific safety and safeguards needs of a reprocessing facility. And finally, in SECI 210026, the staff requested commission approval to discontinue spent fuel reprocessing rulemaking activity. The staff stated that in the event that the NRC received an application for a commercial reprocessing facility, the NRC would likely use the existing regulatory framework in Part 50, noting, however, that exemptions from certain Part 50 requirements would be needed. 
The NRC staff is currently in pre-application engagements with two vendors regarding potential future applications for a reprocessing facility. Uh, the first vendor, Oklo, has expressed interest in designing, building, and operating a fuel recycling facility that would produce uranium transuranic bearing fuel, referred to as U-True fuel. The facility would produce fuel for Oklo's metal-fueled fast reactors, closing the advanced reactor fuel cycle. The proposed facility would be technologically different from the previously licensed facilities in the United States, such as West Valley, Barnwell, and Morris, which were aqueous-based facilities, and would be based on electrochemical processing technology that has been extensively studied at Idaho National Laboratory and Argonne National Laboratory. In December 2022, Oklo submitted a licensing project plan outlining the pre-application engagements with the NRC. Since then, Oklo participated in three public meetings with the NRC staff discussing topics such as the licensing strategy and approach and the preliminary material categorization for a fuel recycling facility. Additional public meetings on technical and licensing topics will be planned throughout calendar year 2024. The second vendor, Shine Technologies, plans to construct and operate a used nuclear fuel recycling pilot facility to demonstrate the technology and economics necessary for the used nuclear fuel recycling to be viable. Shine plans to extract usable materials, including uranium and plutonium for, next, for new mixed oxide and recycled uranium fuel, and valuable fission product isotopes such as neptunium-237. Shine also intends to harvest the actinides for sale or future destruction through transmutation, further reducing the toxicity and longevity of the remaining waste. Shine estimates that after reprocessing, approximately 95% of waste will be suitable for near surface disposal. Shine's proposed facility throughput is estimated to be up to 200 metric ton of initial heavy metal per year. Uh, the pilot facility will process spent fuel that has been decayed uh, at least 40 years after discharge from the reactor. Uh, Shine's reprocessing technology will use the co-decontamination process called Codicon, uh, which is a modified version of the Purex liquid-liquid separation process that is used to separate the major actinides from the bulk dissolved spent fuel. A key differentiation from the Purex process is that plutonium is never separated from uranium, which provides increased proliferation resistance. Currently, 10 CFR Part 50 provides the licensing framework for production and utilization facilities. A reprocessing facility would likely fall under the definition of a production facility in 10 CFR 50.2. In addition, licensees under Part 50 must also comply with the requirements found in other parts of Title 10 of the Code of Federal Regulations, some of which are shown on the slide, such as, for example, 10 CFR Part 20, Standards for Protection Against Radiation, 10 CFR Part 51, Environmental Protection Regulations for Domestic Licensing and Related Regulatory Functions, and so forth. There are approximately two dozen regulatory guides that provide guidance on various topics applicable to reprocessing facilities. With a few exceptions, the majority of these documents have not been updated since the early 70s, and as a result, the guidance contained in these documents is rather limited and may be inconsistent with the regulations as they have evolved in the past 50 years. There is no standard review plan developed specifically for reviewing a fuel reprocessing facility application, which may present a challenge both for the NRC staff and potential applicants in terms of defining clear expectations for the format content and the acceptability of an application for a reprocessing facility. However, Regulatory Guide 3.26, Standard Format and Content of Safety Analysis Reports for Fuel Reprocessing Plants, provides some guidance for various technical topics that the NRC staff would expect to see addressed in an application for a reprocessing facility. The NRC staff cautions, however, that this document has not been updated since 1975, and therefore the guidance contained therein is incomplete and may be out of date. In uh, uh, 2023, the NRC staff formed a working group aid, aimed at evaluating the regulatory framework that would be used by future applicants for processing facilities. The staff is evaluating whether any updates would be needed to the existing guidance or if new guidance would need to be developed to aid the applicants and the NRC staff. The working group recommended the development of an annotated outline for a standard review plan that is specific to reprocessing facilities. This work is currently in progress and the staff is planning to hold a public meeting in a few months and soliciting public feedback on the document. The annotated outline will then be used in the development of the standard review plan. 
The staff's view remains that licensing or processing facility can be adequately and safely accomplished under the existing framework in 10 CFR Part 50. Moreover, the Commission has not given any new direction to the staff to resume the reprocessing rulemaking. However, the NRC staff continues to look for opportunities to develop and update existing guidance to improve the efficiency of the future licensing reviews of reprocessing facility applications. And uh, this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Appreciate it. I think it's really great to hear the you know from the three presentations so far that both the NRC and DOE are looking at the entire fuel process and uh, not only the front end but the back end and even potential for recycling that we're starting to see as well. Thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, John M. A. Donaldson, who is uh, senior Vi Pre vice president and chief marketing officer for Centris Energy Corporation. Mr. Donaldson joined Centris in 1995 in the Advanced Technology Department. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics from Hamden Sydney College, a Master's degree in Nuclear Engineering from the University of Virginia, and a, Masters of Business, a Master of Business Administration degree uh, from Queen's University. Thanks for being here with us, uh, John. Good afternoon. Um, I was lucky enough at lunch today to sit in on a NEI hosted event where they had a speaker who's published a book called Smart Brevity. And the gist of his presentation that is an audience when they receive a presentation only remembers one thing. So unfortunately, I've already written this presentation before this lunch today, so, so bear with me. Uh, I work for Centris uh, Energy. We're a publicly traded company. We're traded on the New York Stock Exchange. This is our safe harbor language. It's our company disclaimer. My personal disclaimer is that I'm a nuclear engineer, not a regulatory person. However, I have brought our company regulatory expert with me. So if you have any tough questions in that area, I may uh, have to phone a friend. Who we are, Centris Energy is the only American-owned uranium enrichment company. Our headquarters is in Bethesda, Maryland. It's about two miles straight out the back door there. Uh, we have two business units. I run our commercial broker trader LEU low enriched uranium supply business. We have customers in the United States, Asia, and Europe. Uh, our second business line is American Centrifuge Operations with locations in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and Piketon, Ohio. How did we get here? I know this past Sunday, the movie Oppenheimer won a seven Academy Awards. Uh, you know, for those of you that have seen the film, a key part of the success that's visually shown uh, for the Manhattan Project was the ability of the United States to enrich uranium, increasing the level of the U-235 isotope. Now, uranium enrichment factored heavily in the Cold War for both the weapons programs and naval propulsion. President Eisenhower, authored the Atoms for Peace program, which gave the United States leadership in both commercial nuclear power and in, not, in a global nonproliferation. As the Cold War, war near, neared its end, the United States was the gl dominant global supplier of uranium enrichment. But competition was emerging. At this point in time, in the mid-1980s, the United States Department of Energy enriched enough uranium for all of the reactors in the United States, Japan, and most of Europe. Coming forward to today, the total global enrichment market has had a complete reversal. The United States is now dependent on imports for enriched uranium. Russia dominates the global uranium enrichment supply with about 46% of capacity. And together, Russia and China have about 60% of global enrichment capacity. The future. As Western markets look to transition to more stable sources of supply, we have built the American Centrifuge Facility and there is a clear need for a new U.S. enricher. A 
Last October, Centra started the initial production from our American centrifuge facility. We hosted a ribbon cutting ceremony attended by high ranking officials from the Department of Energy, the nuclear industry, labor unions, various elected officials, and representatives from the U.S. military. Our facility is multi-purpose. It's licensed for the production of LEU, LEU Plus, and HALU, which would be the fuel required for advanced, many advanced reactor designs. And it's applicable for both commercial and national security needs. The American Centrifuge Enrichment Technology is at TR9. Uh, it's technical readiness level nine, meaning that actual systems have been proven in operational environment. But we need to expand this facility, and we can do so with a 36-month timeline between the final investment decision to initial production. For those of you that haven't seen the site, our, our commercial site in Piketon, Ohio, is a huge facility. It has two million square feet of area under roof. There's two existing buildings there. Each could house enough enrichment capacity for about 1.75 million SWOOs per year of centrifuges. Uh, so together, at the 3.5 level, if those two buildings were built out, that would be enough separative capacity to fuel about 25% of the entire U.S. demand. The situation today is where one company has a dominant position for the supply of uranium enrichment for the United States. The only competition currently comes from Russian supply, which is likely facing U.S. sanctions. Without an additional independent, hopefully U.S.-owned production, the United States will de be dependent on foreign suppliers and without any downward pressure on price, which will impact the competitiveness of commercial nuclear power in the United States. In conclusion, we need three things to deploy our facility to commercial scale. We need significant investment by the United States government to provide a more level playing field. Now, there's an update on that. Last Friday, the uh, bill was signed to appropriate $2.72 billion to fund the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act. So we're hopeful in that respect. Uh, secondly, we need firm offtake commitments from our customers that would allow us to do the third step, which is getting equity investment from the private sector. Thank you. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. And uh, I just want to say I, I hope that uh, folks in the room will remember more than one thing from your presentation and all presentations. And I hope the one thing if they go away with one thing from yours, I hope it isn't just that they'll remember one thing. So uh, hopefully <laughs> more technical. Um, I will say it was really, from my standpoint, looking at your slides, the, the two graphs you have between 1985 and uh, uh, 2022 were pretty, pretty dramatic. So it was uh, interesting to see that graph. Thank you. Next, I'd like to welcome ASN Commissioner Jean-Luc uh, Lushum. Uh, Commissioner Lachum was appointed by the President of the National Assembly as ASN Commissioner in 2018. He is also currently the Chairman of the Association of the European Radiological Protection Regulators, HERCA. He joined ASN in 1998 and in 2004 was appointed Deputy Director General. He graduated from the French Naval Academy in 1980 and began his career in the French Navy as a Naval Officer. Uh, welcome, Jean-Luc. Thank you for this kind introduction. Uh, and thank you also to the USNRC for inviting me to be a speaker in this uh, session. It's uh, very important for us. And I 
Also, I'm glad to be here back in the uh, Washington DC area because it, for me is the first time since the end of the pandemic. So <laughs> I think it's a good thing. But uh, I'm here to speak to you about the regulatory challenges for ASN as a French regulator. We are the counterpart of the USNRC with the future of nuclear fuel cycle. So I have a short presentation divided in three parts. The first will be to speak about the French context and French nuclear industry, if you are not aware of. Second part, I'll speak about uh, SMRs and uh, ATF challenges, and then i conclude. Here uh, on this map is not the map of the French vineyards, even if there are some overlaps. It's a map of uh, the French nuclear power industry with the NPP, fuel cycle facilities, uh, research activities also. You can see it's all, all around uh, France. But what I want to mention here, because I think it's important, it's the, um, to speak about the French specificities regarding nuclear industry. The first thing uh, that is uh, important is that we have a very limited number of operators, e EDF for uh, electricity production, Orano for fuel cycle, facilities, ANDRA for radioactive waste management, and CEA for nuclear research activities. And specifically about uh, fuel cycle, uh, in France, except the mines, we have uh, all the facilities, starting with a conversion facility called Malvisi, enrichment facility called George Bess II, uh, two kinds of fuel uh, fabrications, one of uranium fabrication owned by Orat Formatum, it's in Romand, and, and the second is producing uh, MOX fuel uh, owned by uh, Orano, it's called Melox. And then for the back end of, of the fuel, we already have a reprocessing plant under operation for a long time, for more than uh, 50 years. In La Hague, it's uh, in Normandy. And oh, another characteristic uh, that has consequences for the regulation is that we have only one kind of uh, NPP, one kind of reactor with its light water reactors. And for the fuel, there are two main providers, Framatome and uh, Westinghouse. So now I come to one of the two specific as aspects regarding this uh, session. It's about uh, the small modular reactors. In on this slide, uh, you have the list, in fact, of the main important projects uh, in France for SMRs. They are supposed to produce either electricity or uh, industrial heat or hydrogen, mainly. So there are this, uh, about uh, 10, uh, 10 projects. On the top, there are the most advanced uh, projects, and the, on the bottom, the less advanced uh, projects. And indeed, we have three uh, kind of categories. The first category is light water reactors, and the most advanced is a project called New World led by EDF. Uh, the other is called uh, Calogena, it's less advanced. But uh, regarding the fuel, the important thing to consider is that they are supposed to use uh, more or less standard fuel uh, with a level of uh, enrichment under 5%. The second category of, uh, of small regular reactors are sodium fast reactors. Uh, in, in France, we still have some experience with uh, sodium fast reactors. So that's why uh, the color we use here is yellow. We have four kinds of projects. The, the two first are called Exana and Otrera. 
they are sodium fast reactors, the kind of reactors we know the better. And in this category, uh, there are also high temperature reactors with two, uh, two projects. For the first kind, they are supposed to use a fuel a MOX, a sodium fast react uh, fuel. But for the, uh, the second part, they are supposed to use a triso fuel. This kind of fuel has already been mentioned during the previous uh, presentations. Uh, regarding uh, um, our uh, perspective, uh, it's a tricky issue for, uh, for France and also for the regulator, but first for the industry. The first thing is that there is no industrial production capacity of uh, this kind of fuel in Europe, in France and in Europe. And also, uh, it also has been mentioned during the, first, the previous presentation, we have no HALU uh, supply in Europe. The most important supplier was Russia, but today it's, as you can imagine, it's not possible to deal with them. And on the bottom, the more innovative reactors. One is the lead fast reactors, but regarding fuel, they're supposed to use also MOX fuel. And totally in the bottom, it's a very innovative reactors because they're supposed to use molten salt reactors. And clearly there, there's no, not at all any industrial production capacity in France or in Europe. And there are also complexity because there is a need to have a step of prior enrichment in chloride 37 needed. So uh, about uh, the fuel uh, challenges, specifically uh, considering from the point of view of the regulator, clearly for us, the whole fuel cycle, dismantling activity, the radioactive waste management have to be taken into account since the beginning. Uh, and it's the same thing also here for the US NRC. Clearly, the specific issues we have in our agenda, this year we should receive a license application for a modular construction facility by Jimmy. Jimmy, Jimmy is the name of the company. They are supposed to build uh, uh, a facility to build the reactor vessels. Uh, they issued a press release uh, last month saying that uh, they will establish this facility in Burgundy. And second, we should receive this year a license pre-application for a MOX fuel fabrication facility by uh, Nucleo. We also consider the safety objectives about the small modular reactor with how safe is safe enough because small modular reactor offer certainly interesting perspectives for enhanced capacities of safety. But uh, in the end for this, uh, this aspect of small modular reactors, Clearly, it's a real challenge for us. And at uh, ASN, we have to adapt our uh, organization and way to regulate this kind of facility. So far, we have created uh, inside ASN a, a small unit to uh, deal with SMR project. And this uh, unit is in close contact with uh, our with IRSN, we, which is our technical support organization, to be more effective to deal with very, this very numerous project of SMRs. Uh, another point I, I wanted to, to touch is the question of, of ATF. Uh, for us, a ATF is more a commercial issue, issue than a safety issue. Because fuel modifications re result from several industrial needs. First, to take into account operating experience or new operating constraints, and also to improve the behavior of fuel 
assemblies under accidental conditions. Uh, regarding uh, ATF, EDF, our main operators, its strategy is based on evolutionary designs of the fuel rods with the development in cooperation with suppliers with a preliminary qualification, including tests in nuclear reactors. And I think there are currently some tests in uh, some US uh, reactors. But the important thing is that it takes time to implement modifications, probably five to 10 years, and, and probably more if uh, it's about uh, using breakthrough uh, technologies. Uh, for EDF midterm uh, strategy, there are also there are currently consideration of uh, chromium coated cladding. It's already tested on some operating reactors. Pellets doped, doped with uh, chromium and uh, uh, aluminium and chromium also. But for uh, the French uh, perspective, it's important that uh, this has to be taken into account with the possibility to reprocess the fuel. Because it's not possible to use uh, this kind of fuel if it's not possible to reprocess it because it's uh, the French strategy to reprocess the fuel. And a long, on a long-term uh, strategy, e EDF uh, thinks about uh, using a ceramic uh, cladding and also high-density pellets. But clearly, this question of ATF, uh, for ASN, we consider it more uh, as a usual assessment uh, process. It's nothing new. It's what we are doing uh, every day. But to conclude with uh, ATF, I also wanted to mention a, a specific uh, European uh, concern, uh, just for you to know. Because in Europe, we have a so-called European taxonomy regulation. It's about the classification of economical, economical activities having a positive impact on environment. And regarding that, the objective is for the European Union to promote the investment on green activities. And regarding that, very recently, it has been decided that nuclear energy could be, uh, could be uh, considered as a uh, green activity regarding EU taxonomy. But with one thing that is curious, it's if in uh, European reactors, by 2025, they are using ATF. So for us, uh, it's not an obvious thing, considering the fact that there is no clear definition of what an ATF is. We can consider that we already use uh, in our uh, French reactors uh, a fuel tolerant for accident. And regarding that, uh, there is a, a statement from uh, our European Association of Nuclear Reactor Regulators called WENRA, drawing the attention of the Commission on this issue, saying uh, that uh, if by ATF it means uh, fuel with breakthrough technologies, it's not possible to implement uh, it by 2025. I, I close it here because it's uh, more uh, e EU cooking than something else. So to conclude, for ASN, the current main regulatory challenge is with small modular reactors, with because we see coming many newcomers with sometimes a very limited nuclear experience. Also innovative designs, innovative fuel concepts, mainly not anticipated, and also for us, uh, for ASN, a uh, limited capacity of assessment. So that's why international cooperation is thus welcome. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Commissioner Lashum. Uh, we're, before we go to Q and A uh, session, and I do have a list of uh, questions online here. Uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists for the presentation. Very informative. I'd like to give them a round of applause. So we have time to start going through the questions. We don't know if we'll make it through all of them, and uh, I'm going to try to start with a couple easy ones here, and uh, and they may get hard pretty quick, but uh, we'll start. So Jason, is the uh, Fuels Atlas you mentioned available online? So I'm not sure which heads words I'm going to use to start all my answers, but <laughs> it depends, um, or it's complicated. Um, so part of the atlas is online. I mentioned the infographic and I mentioned the web page. Those are sort of our two um, initial efforts to get information to the public. The regulatory planner piece, that's the complicated part. We're still working on that. We're gathering information. We're still trying to determine what that's going to look like, both internally and then how we're going to take that information and get it to the public. But as I mentioned, the goal is to get as much information as we can to the public and to anybody else that's interested to make sure that we're communicating exactly what it is we're doing with respect to new fuels. Great. Thanks, Jason. Uh, the next one, we had a question. How can I get copies of these presentation slides? And I'm looking to my folks over here, and I'm, um, them, Reese, they're all online, correct? So if you go to the website, uh, how you logged into this session, all the slides should be available. If you're having trouble, please stop and see one of the ladies at the front desk here, and they'll get you to the right person. Uh, the next question I see Victoria and Jorge are sharing a mic, so I'm going to have them share a question here. They both may want to chime in on this one. Uh, are there any legal barriers preventing a private company who wants to do reprocessing, such as Oklo or Shine, from taking the spent fuel from a utility? Um, right, so uh, thanks, John. So I, I have to uh, preface my answer with <laughs> um, a statement that I'm actually not an expert on. Uh, possession of spent fuel. So I'm, I'm sure there's certain questions that need to be explored there. So um, there's certainly going to have to be a conversation with, um, we would encourage a conversation with the NRC about uh, what plans uh, such private entity, whether that's Oklo Shine or any other potential applicant would have with regard to um, taking title of spent fuel and how that's, um, you know, how that's going to work out and sort of at what part in the process they plan to take possession, if at all. Um, but uh, um, there, there's perhaps another question I'd, I'd, I'd like to kind of bring up, just sort of thinking back to one of the uh, SECI papers that I've mentioned, and the specifically the 2011 SECI paper, the draft regulatory basis, um, discusses another important question, which was the uh, um, um, the question of the disposition of high-level waste, as, uh, and this was actually one of the regulatory gaps identified in the, uh, in the regulatory basis, and I just looked it up on my phone. It was regulatory gap number two. So uh, dis uh, discussed uh, um, uh, the uh, potential issue of the generation of high-level waste from reprocessing, which we um, believe is likely. Um, and so the question to be that, that would definitely need to be reviewed very closely and addressed is what, what's going to happen with the um, high-level waste that may result from reprocessing and how that is going to be dispositioned. So um, I think there is definitely a, a potential uh, policy question there um, and definitely a, a regulatory uh, challenge that we would need to uh, take a look at closely. Great. If I could ask Jorge if you would wanted to add any to that response from DOE's perspective on legal barriers preventing the possession, and maybe Victoria already stood, touched into something related to this, and another question that uh, was um, marked for your attention was, where is SMR spent nuclear fuel likely to end up being stored? What is the physical location? Um, so, uh, in regard to the first question, I cannot comment on any of the legal aspects of uh, reprocessing. Uh, however, I can, I can tell you that the Department of Energy is learning on the, the technical aspects that uh, companies like Oklo and Shine are proposing. So, we're um, trying to get an awareness of what's being proposed. Um, from the Department of Energy, there's another office in charge of uh, reprocessing research and development. So, uh, they might be more informed uh, in terms of what, what, what would that be. Um, and then for the uh, SMR question, 
um, I can mention that um, some of the react the 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 vendors working uh, near deployment or near demonstration have uh, designed uh, spent nuclear fuel storage as part of their uh, reactor design. So for some of them, you would see uh, some facilities uh, collocated in the in the reactor facility uh, where they are planning on storing spent nuclear fuel. Thank you. Appreciate that. I'm glad to hear that uh, DOE, as we said earlier, like NRC, is already looking at the back end for many of those processes. Uh, so the next question I have was for uh, Mr. Donaldson, and I'll read the question verbatim. Uh, since losing out on a loan guarantee over a decade ago, how much has Centris been able to bring down its cost per SWU so that you can commercially compete with the likes of Urenco or Orano? Yeah, so Centris has made several changes from the prior program run by its predecessor, USEC. Uh, now, at the time, USEC was trying to replace not only our gaseous diffusion plant that was a large facility, made you know, 5 million SWOOs a year or more. We were also replacing the HEU downblend deal. So we needed to replace 11 million SWOO of capacity. The program we're looking at now would be smaller in scope. And with a smaller scope, we're able to bring the manufacturing from being located in many states with many vendors internally, and that would reduce our cost. Uh, the second leg of the stool is that uh, there's now an opportunity in HALU production that didn't necessarily exist in this fashion 15 years ago. So that's not only a new opportunity, but with it there's a need for unobligated fuel, which we feel is a real differentiator for our technology versus some of the others. And then the last thing I would mention is that the world's in a dramatically different place than it was in 2010. You know, with Russian supply in the market, the enrichment market is oversupplied. But if you remove Russia and China, you take away 60 percent of the supply, then the market's dramatically undersupplied. So um, the United States government has a RFP out currently for HALU in that there is a strong preference indicated for new U.S. production. And uh, we feel that the government will give priority to supporting new U.S. production versus funding uh, foreign governments to further expand the, the facilities that those governments stood up to start with. Thank you. Uh, the next question I think was intended for also you, Mr. Donaldson, but I would ask uh, you and then also maybe uh, Commissioner uh, Lashum, you may want to chime in on this as well. And I think it's coming your way, Mr. Donaldson, based on your slides. Uh, Demand for rich uranium, uh, what is the outlook? Do we really need small modular or micro reactors for demand to pick up speed? Uh, in the West, I think in the U.S. we have a heavy um, view of SMRs being the, the, the key driver of new demand. Uh, that doesn't necessarily exist outside the United States. I got to participate in an IAEA ministerial meeting last year, and we met with different energy delegations, and I believe it was Poland, but it could have been another similarly situated country. They asked, has the United States given up on large LWR reactors? And it's kind of a wake-up call for me that you know, we haven't done a great job of deploying new large LWRs in the U.S., but other countries have found ways to do them. Uh, more on time uh, and on, on budget. So that's thing one. Thing two, the existing LWR fleet, you know, when I started, it had a 40-year license. Most of the plants would have been closed by now, but we've gone on to license extension and subsequent license extension with uh, higher utilizations of fuel with higher capacity factors. So uh, we, we see a very sustainable business with the existing fleet, potentially more reactors being built in countries like the UK and Poland and the Czech Republic, and uh, I think that any boost we get from the SMRs you know, gives us another platform to succeed. Great. Thank you, that, and appreciate you touching on international. Um, Commissioner Lashum, did, would you like to respond to that as well? Well, uh, regarding uh, this question of SMRs used, uh, I, I think it's different for every country in uh, Europe. Uh, regarding France, uh, we, uh, we we have in fact e enough reactors for now and for the, the future with big reactors. 
to produce electricity. And specifically for electricity use, there's, there's no need and no, no room for SMR producing electricity. But uh, we have large comp company, EDF and Framatome, who are uh, builders of uh, nuclear reactors. So uh, they have this project of small modular reactor called uh, New World. But clearly, it's not for uh, French domestic use. Even if they uh, built uh, one reactor of this kind, in, in France, I think it will be only one for the purpose of uh, demonstrations of, the, uh, of uh, the, the design, but not for use uh, in, in France to produce electricity. But there's not only uh, the, the use of electricity that is supposed to be uh, done by small modular reactors, considering, considering the question of decarbonation of the industry, there is also, there are also other uh, possible uses like uh, industrial heat. And in uh, one of the projects I mentioned, uh, uh, Jimmy, is, it's uh, specially for that. It's specially to be used for a production of industrial heat. And in this case, probably uh, there are some possible opportunities in, in France and elsewhere in, in Europe for all the kind of uh, uh, use and uh, production of uh, electricity. Great, thank you, appreciate that. I have a question here that may be a slight bit off topic, but I'm gonna ask it directly and then maybe ask if you can expand on it a little bit, uh, Commissioner Lachum. So directly I'll read, in light of the increasing interest in space nuclear systems, how can international stakeholders collaborate to establish unified safety regulations and standards ensuring that the development and deployment of these systems are conducted safely and sustainably across global space missions. And I'll say I'll expand that a bit because it does talk about space and I would, you know, if you are interested in, and have a response to that, I would appreciate it. But I think the underlying part of working on international safety standards and regulations, uh, if you had any insights related to how uh, countries can, can uh, coordinate on those for the front end and back end of the fuel cycle, we'd appreciate that as well. You mean use for space? Yeah, the, the question was uh, in light of the increasing interest in space nuclear systems. But again, I, if, if you'd rather respond from the standpoint of the front end and the back end of the fuel cycle, I think the question still has a lot of applicability there of how can we uh, collaborate to establish a unified safety regulations and standards? Uh, regarding uh, that, uh, there's no uh, specific uh, uh, application as I can see in, in France, but uh, regarding uh, SMRs, uh, uh, about international cooperation, we see uh, two, uh, two axes of cooperation. The first uh, was mentioned this morning during the plenary session by Lydie Evra from IAEA. There are uh, the, this project in the, under the framework of IAEA which uh, this program called NESI for uh, harmonizing the, the uh, regulatory uh, processes. And also a second uh, aspect we are working on is more on uh, bilateral cooperation or cooperation directly with other regulators with specific designs. It, it's what is going on here in the US with uh, Canada and UK, I think it has been mentioned this morning, and it's what we are doing in, uh, in France currently uh, with uh, the Finnish regulator and uh, Rep Czech Republic regulator, specifically on the new world design. It's, uh, I think it's a relevant way to cooperate on specific uh, design and to deal with uh, technical issues. Thank you, appreciate that answer. Uh, Victoria had a couple questions here I'll, I'll combine together and both related to reprocessing. The first is, isn't most of 10 CFR Part 50 written specifically for licensing light water reactors and therefore not applicable to a reprocessing plant? 
uh, and closely related are, are there any plans to update the applicable NRC fuel reprocessing guidance? Um, right, so uh, uh, to the first part of the question regarding uh, uh, Part 50. So um, uh, Part 50 is a, um, a, a, a Part 50 licensing framework um, uh, is for production and utilization facilities and uh, the NRC staff believes that a reprocessing facility would likely fall under the definition of a production facility. Uh, so in that sense, we f find that uh, uh, quite likely the regulations in Part 50 will apply. Um, however, um, it is fair to note that Part 50, as it has evolved over the last several decades, has become a reactor-centric regulation. Um, and so there are certain aspects of uh, um, Part 50, there are certain sections of Part 50 that would not apply to a reprocessing facility. Um, however, there are a number of sections that still do apply, right? Um, so um, an applicant would definitely need to consider uh, the applicable portions of Part 50 and addressing them and, and their application. And again, we certainly would encourage any potential applicant to um, come in and talk to us during the, um, and have a pre-application engagement so that we could um, make sure that we are on the same page regarding the, uh, um, uh, the, the path forward and the content of an application. Uh, regarding the plans to update uh, guidance, uh, so um, as, uh, um, as I had mentioned, I mentioned that during my presentation, the staff is currently working on developing an annotated outline for a reprocessing uh, standard review plan. Uh, so, um, the annotated the, the the plan is to um, the uh, uh, the staff uh, would then take the annotated outline and develop a standard review plan uh, using that annotated outline as a starting point. Um, there is other guidance available. Um, the uh, the regulatory guides that are applicable to reprocessing facilities. Uh, the staff is currently reviewing these regulatory guides and uh, discussing actively discussing whether. Uh, some of these regulatory guides need to be updated now in the future or not at all. Um, and uh, we, we do not yet uh, at this time have a uh, fully formulated plan as to how we're going to move forward with updating these regulatory guides, but this is something we're actively looking at. Great. Thanks. Thank you. The, the next question um, was listed as intended for Jason, but I'd say the first part of it, Jorge, if you have any insights from DOE's perspective, we'd appreciate that as well, is what is the latest status, what is the latest status and schedule of needed criticality benchmarks for higher fuel enrichments? And then does this schedule align with NRC licensing review schedules? So I, I see I, I'm gonna use my phone a friend. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> So there, there's a couple different ways to answer this question. Um, I want to break it down. Status, we'll talk um, uh, just a real quick uh, about what the schedule looks like and then how this feeds back into the New Fuels Atlas. So as far as the status goes, the Energy Act of 2020 and subsequently the Inflation Reduction Act provided both direction and appropriations for the NRC to work collaboratively with, collaboratively with the DOE to address this particular issue. So. There's active work going on right now. I would say that the status of that active work is in the scoping phase, um, and that's going to start ramping up as we start looking into how we're going to start spending the appropriations that are associated with this activity. So that's the first part of the question in terms of the initial status of it. As far as how it aligns with um, some of our licensing activities, I'm going to answer it in the way that's, um, I guess, a double negative is it's not misaligned with our current licensing activities. And the reason I say it that way is because we haven't found yet that the lack of those criticality benchmarks and some of the activities with the critical experiments are not going to necessarily be a limitation in whether or not we can license. It's going to be a limitation in terms of how we license and whether it's efficiently and effectively. Um, I think we've shown, at least with some of the initial certification and licensing actions we've undertaken, that we've been able to deal with enrichments up to 28 percent, even absent those critical benchmarks and in, in the criticality experience. But having those will make our work easier, I think, longer term as we start to see more and more of these facilities come online or more and more of these activities take place. So I think that's, that's a big part of it. Um, 
you know, one of the other things I would point out too is that, you know, conservatisms and uncertainty analysis are part of that activity. So it's a way that we can do this safely without having those benchmarks in place at this point. Jorge, do you want to add what DOE's interest there? Uh, yeah, so uh, from the back side, uh, all I can say is that there are some research and development activities that are looking at accident tolerant fuel and high burnout uh, spent nuclear fuel. Um, and those activities, I, I believe it started maybe last fiscal year, so it's a work in progress. Thanks. And by the way, Jason, phone a friend is appropriate. It wasn't, as long as it wasn't the person to your left, I was good with that. Um, so I think we maybe have time for one or two more questions here. Uh, Commissioner Lashoon, uh, I have a two-part question here. What is the current status of back-end preparations for advanced reactor fuels in France? Is there any uh, certainty on waste forms or spent fuel storage and transportation packages? Well, uh, like I said during my um, presentation, we, uh, we require that the uh, question of this back end fuel is uh, taken into account since uh, the beginning. And so far, in fact, uh, the back end will depend on the, on the technologies used. If it's uh, light water reactors, I don't see uh, many technical issues or regulatory issues for them to be uh, treated, treated in the current fuel, uh, fuel cycle facilities, even maybe there's the need of some adjustments. So uh, it's not, not for me a major issue, but it's a different story for more innovative uh, fuels. Be because uh, for other kind of fuels, like, for example, triso fuel, and, and more, it's probably more difficult also for molten salt fu uh, react fuels, because uh, today uh, we have no idea of how it can be uh, treated uh, in the end. So uh, uh, my, my answer is that if there, there is an existing uh, way to treat it, it's probably okay, but it's not, it will be uh, difficult. Great, thank you. I think I have time for one last question, and Mr. Donaldson, if I could uh, direct this to you. Uh, we heard a lot at uh, our morning um, plenary sessions about how NRC can be more efficient in adapting to the changing landscape. As someone who just recently went through a licensing process with the NRC, is there any recommendations for how uh, regulators can be more efficient in the way uh, we're preparing and reviewing applications? As I said in my disclaimer, I'd have to call on Dan Watts, who's sitting there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I know that we have a very strong relationship with the NRC, and I've worked at past jobs where that wasn't always the case. Uh, so I. I think the general experience, at least in the C-level suite, was that uh, all the licensing was uh, very positive and, and we, we were happy with the interaction. Great. And we'll reach out to Dan since you gave us his name as a phone a friend and we can talk to him as well. But uh, yeah, our time, time is up for this session. Uh, I want to, again, thank all the panelists. I also want to thank all the attendees, a very large number of folks in the room, large number of people online. Uh, we did not get through all the questions today, uh, so we will be looking at those and coordinating with our coordinators of uh, whether we could address some of those online after the session. Uh, also, you should get a QR code for providing feedback for this session. We would greatly appreciate that. Um, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the RIC. Have a great Tuesday. <laughs>